Hey folks. Hi everyone. Welcome, welcome. This is the second part of a two-parter, the first time we've done a two-parter um, on raising multiracial children. And the first one was called Examining the Complexity of Multiracial Identity. You, could, uh, you can watch that on our website and it's also on Facebook and YouTube. Um, it was fantastic and it was a great, um, a great first part uh, to lead into this conversation. So uh, you might wanna check that one out after if you haven't. And tonight, um, the conversation's a bit different. The, the title of this um, conversation is Raising Multiracial Children, Dismantling Anti-Blackness in Multiracial Families. So um, we're, uh, we know that um, sort of anti-blackness is prevalent in US culture, around the world really, it's globally prevalent, and that that messaging really does show up in multiracial um, families, even when uh, they're non-black families. There's, uh, they're, none of their races are black, still anti-blackness shows, uh, shows up the way you know, white supremacy does, right? So very related. So we're gonna talk about how it shows up in multiracial families, in particular uh, with our fabulous guests. And um, they will talk about sort of the, the um, certain myths that <clears throat> um, allow anti-blackness to be perpetuated in uh, multiracial families and talk about how those myths negatively impact multiracial children in their identity development and what we can do about it. Uh, we'll come to concrete steps. So we'll talk um, for, to them for about uh, 20, 25 minutes after Andrew introduces them and then we'll turn to your questions. And many of you, as always, sent uh, fantastic questions in um, previous, uh, when you registered. So you can also uh, put them in Facebook, put them in the Q&A. Um, Andrew. Yes. Welcome, folks. Um, and welcome uh, to you. Welcome to our guests. Um, we are live on Facebook and on Zoom. Let me introduce you. I think the most of you, for sure, uh, most of you uh, who are uh, sort of attending or watching this, um, attended the first one. So I won't, I'm gonna cut down a little bit on the uh, introduction, but we have three fabulous guests back with us uh, after being here on Thursday. Victoria Melanie Brown, Dr. Uh, Melanie Brown, is a multicultural scholar Sorry, I'm sorry, a multiracial scholar, practitioner, and soon to be mom of a multiracial son. She works at Columbia University and actively researches how multiracial college students experience racism and engage with racial justice. We also have Dr. Marcella Runell Hall, who is the VP for Student Life at Mount Holyoke College and an affiliated member of the Center of Racial Justice and Youth Engaged Research at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's also the white mom, a white mom committed to anti-racist pro-liberation parenting, raising two young daughters who identify as black and mixed. Welcome to you both. And also to Dr. Kelly Faye Jackson, who's an associate professor in the School of Social Work at Arizona State University. Uh, Kelly's a social worker and a multiracial person who examines the identity development and overall well-being of people of mixed racial and ethnic heritage she identifies as a mixed black and white uh, person and resides in Phoenix with her partner, her young daughter, and their puppy. Thanks for being here. Uh, I, I realized that I forgot to introduce us. Uh, Melissa Giroux, co-founder of Embrace Race. And Andrew Grant Thomas, also and, a co-founder. And I'm um, black, white, multiracial. And uh, I'm a Jamaican-born African-American. Yeah, and we're also and, a couple couple. So there you go. We'll jump right into the question. So good to have you back. Um, last time, you know, again, the the uh, uh, Thursday's program was really about introducing folks to the complexity of multiracial identity. Uh, and we ended that, and there's a lot of complexity there. Um, and we ended that with uh, a question about, you know, I asked a question of you about where where's this, how are you feeling, right? A lot of change, a lot of flux, a lot going on for multiracial people, multiracial identity, the politics of that. And mm -hmm. Kelly, you in particular pointed us forward to this program mm -hmm. and to the sh your shared concern about, um, yes, anti-Blackness uh, 
and a sort of powerful strain of anti-blackness in, in multiracial, you know, um, uh, socialization uh, in some homes and so on. So the first question, we get to basics. What brought you to this topic, each of you, uh, of anti-blackness in multiracial families? And Victoria, we'll start with you. Sure. So uh, th thanks again for having us tonight. Um, I'm excited to kind of talk a little bit more on a deeper level with uh, those joining us this evening. But what, what kind of brought us here together was it was in 2017, actually. So we've been thinking about this topic for some time. We all attended the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in American Higher Education. The acronym, because in higher education, we like to use acronyms all the time, is NCORE. And this is a fantastic conference that is offered to um, really anyone who's interested in taking a deeper dive into understanding race and ethnicity broadly. But it's, it happens every year uh, around May, end of May into early June. And in 2017, I was a doctoral student at the time at UMass Amherst and was asked to help moderate a conversation on a topic that was called, Can White Family Members Truly Ever Get It? biracial individuals navigating racial justice conversations within interracial families. And so that's what started it. Uh, you know, Marcella and Kelly were, were one of uh, two panelists. We also had additional panelists as well. But the, the broader conversation was a yearning for folks that were in that conversation to talk about whiteness, to talk about um, what it means to be mixed and multiracial, and to be somebody in that conversation where you're, when you're talking about um, anti-blackness too, and how that then is always inherent in the conversation that we can't it, we can't separate those pieces out. And so, more recently, once the new wave of Black Lives Matter occurred with the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and countless others, Kelly uh, reached out. We we hadn't been in touch for a little bit of time, but we've always been following each other and supporting each other. And uh, she reached out and said, "Hey, like." let's kind of have this conversation. I've been noticing these things happening online in the mixed and multiracial community spaces and let's talk more about that. So that's what really brought us together as a group. Um, and then we wanted to kind of think about ways in which we could discuss this a bit more broadly. Um, I think it's also important though, um, just to mention our positionality up front. And I think each one of us is gonna do that right now. Um, for those of you who did attend the first webinar, you learned a little bit about my background, but I want to say that again in case this is the first time you're joining us. Um, so I identify as a multiracial, uh, I identify as an Indo-Caribbean American. Um, Indo-Caribbean really stems from the Caribbean, in particular Trinidad, but other islands as well. Um, I'm also Spanish, white, and Irish, and do have African roots. Um, but I come to this work as part of my personal life experiences growing up in the South, particularly in South Florida, and now living in the Northeast for some time. But my stance on anti-Blackness is, it's the root of oppression and racism in the United States, right? And so in knowing this, inherently, the monoracial Black experience is very different than being someone who's multiracial and yes, can have Black roots or have Blackness in their heritage. But the way you're treated as a monoracial identified Black person, or if someone perceives you as such, is very, contrasting to someone who's mixed and has light skin privilege and other things. So I just wanted to mention that and it needs to be acknowledged. Mixed people need to acknowledge their privileges and be in support of black communities and families. Amen. Kelly, thank you, Victoria. Kelly. Um, yeah, I, I just really appreciate um, you allowing us the space to have conversation with folks about this, because this was exactly um, what I was seeking when I reached out to our previous panel members is um, let's have a conversation. So some of the things that I was observing, I think that was really troubling to me um, was that in multiracial spaces, folks were minimizing or ignoring the importance of Black Lives Matter. Um, also kind of centering um, multiracial experiences and kind of um, saying that they're somehow more um, important than the experiences that are happening right now in, the black, in our black community. Um, the other thing that I noticed was I saw um, that the multiracial community was deliberately like separating ourselves from BLM 
So you might have seen like statements that would come out, um, Latinx for um, BLM, and then I saw some multiracial people for um, Black Lives. And I think for me personally, as a mixed um, Black, white woman, um, I felt offense to that. I think because it assumed that we were separate from these communities or that you can't be both and. Um, so I think for me that was um, something that I struggled with and really wanted to talk about. I think also why it's an issue within the multiracial community has a lot to do with our history um, in, in terms of the multiracial movement and the original organizing by uh, predominantly white parents to have a um, multiracial category on the census. So for us in kind of studying the multiracial movement, we recognize that those efforts, that there was some anti-blackness surrounding those efforts for mixed um, black and white um, children. Their parents were really trying to give them a different label that wasn't about acknowledging their blackness. So, for me, seeing some of that, it just kind of reinforced this history that we already have. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we kind of came together um, and just appreciate the opportunity to have this difficult talk. I think all of us are kind of still having conversations about this and are new to this and are continuing to challenge each other. So thank you. Thank you. Um I just want to say I'm incredibly honored to be a part of this conversation and this panel. Um, and I shared a little bit very briefly last week that, um, you know, I grew up in a family of two white parents. My background is Irish um, American. I moved around a lot and had a lot of different experiences because of that in relationship to interracial friendships and interracial dating relationships, even in my childhood. And so before I ever had language for being an ally, accomplice, co-conspirator, um, that was the work I was trying to engage in. And obviously that is even more um, important right now in this moment in time, and in particular because of my proximity to my family and, and raising two daughters who, as you heard, identify as both mixed and Black in our family with my husband, um, who also identifies as Black. And so this is important for me personally, um, but also professionally, because this idea of anti-Blackness is, is directly connected to something that I think is uncomfortable sometimes to talk about in these spaces, which is this broader notion of white supremacy. And so I, I just want to note, white supremacy really is this belief that whiteness is superior to other races, um, to other backgrounds, and, and fundamentally that the systems that we, we have in the United States, the policies, the practices, the history, the, the um, cultural norms, the, all of that has been shaped um, by that fundamental core belief that is, is sort of baked in to, to our experience. And so that's an important place to start, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, but I wanted to just name that as my perspective coming into this. Thank you, Marcella. And I wonder if we could, this might be a good time to get at definitions um, of anti-Blackness and other terms we should be using in this conversation. I wonder, I want to throw one in, which is, um, uh, so you talked about biracial and multiracial, and there were some questions after the last one, so we could clarify about why one is preferable to the other. Sure, I can take that on. And just quickly, I think it really depends on the person in terms of how they want to identify. Um, I have a lot of close friends who identify as biracial, and I think that's completely fine. I think some of us um, have chosen not to kind of partialize um, what we are, um, because sometimes it reinforces biological kind of beliefs in race. Um, but really, it's, it's about, you know, where the individual is at in terms of, of you know, how they want to identify, so. Okay, so like the so, idea that you're 50-50 is. Yeah, it's kind of, right, you know, not right, family. right. Um, Given our and history. you know, for anyone who's ever taken, you know, um, uh, a, a genetic test looking at ethnicity, you know, we know that those percentages are, are very often and often, you know, wrong. So um, I just, some of these we talked about last um, time we spoke, but wanting to just go through them really quickly. Um, so the first is kind of how we think about race. Um, so 
I tend to like um, Omni and Winant's um, definition of race as a learned social identity um, that is ascribed by others and society. Um, so when you start thinking more critically about race, we recognize it's not a neutral system um, and that is often invented and then reinvented um, by mainly white people in power um, to kind of protect whiteness and white supremacy. So for multiracial people, we saw this in um, using the rule of hypo descent or the one drop rule in categorizing multiracial people back in the day. So as early as the 1890 census, we saw terms like quadroon, like a quarter black, octoroon on the census. Um, so just wanting to be aware of that, that this is kind of entrenched deeply um, in, our, in our history. Um, racism, so thinking again from a critical race framework, racism involves one group having the power to carry out systemic discrimination through the institutional policies and practices of the society and by shaping the cultural beliefs and values that support those racist policies and practices. What I like about the work that's um, being emphasized now by Dr. Kendi is that he puts it kind of quite simply. So to be racist is to be engaging in these policies um, and practices or believing in them and kind of perpetuating these ideas. Um, and finally, a term that's really close to the multiracial community, a relatively new term is monoracism. So this is um, the system, um, systemic social oppression that targets individuals and families who do not identify with multi or monoracial categories. Um, and this, just wanting to plug uh, Dr. Jessica Harris, Dr. Um, Mark Johnson Guerrero, and uh, Kevin Nadal, and Eric Hamako, who really kind of gave us the terminology to kind of describe some of these experiences. And really quickly, some of these experiences include racial identity patrolling. So this is when people eyeball you to try to figure out what your racial background is. Um, racial litmus testing. So this is when people kind of, you know, give you that idea of, well, you're not black enough, you're not Asian enough, um, based kind of on your cultural um, behaviors or appearance. Um, and the final one that is our classic history that is multiracial people, it's really difficult to shake, is the racial passing. So this is the assumption that multiracial people um, who claim multiracial identities or those who look white are passing as white or secretly wish to be white. Right. So we kind of put together a slide to talk more exclusively about delving in right now to anti-blackness. So we're gonna kind of pull that up and kind of think through. I'm a very visual person and I think um, my panelists also um, feel that way. So sometimes it's helpful also for us to kind of visualize what these things mean. So if we go into kind of anti-blackness, um, so this is the historical and current violence exercised against black people at all levels of personal, interpersonal, cultural, political, and economic life. And what I like about this definition, and this is by um, Anna Cecilia Perez, is that the author defines violence very broadly. Um, so this can mean from undermining and not respecting black persons or black leadership to mass incarceration and the murder of black people by police. So we included a couple images here to see how broad anti-blackness can be. So the first we see um, an, 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 a representation of cultural appropriation. So this is the co-opting of a historically oppressed group's culture with little to no acknowledgement. So again, in this case, how some folks, um, in this case, an Asian male is sporting locks, which we know is a hairstyle traditionally associated with persons of African heritage. The second image uh, depicts colorism, which um, is the prejudice or di discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone. Now this one is really, um, 
I think, difficult because it's really rooted in white supremacy and sadly has been internalized by a lot of us um, and many other historically oppressed racial groups. So those are some of the things that we kind of help, help us get to, get to understand a little bit about um, the complexities of anti-Blackness and how it might show up. So now we're gonna look at three ways multiracial families perpetuate um, anti-Blackness. Um, and we're gonna provide some examples from social media. So Marcella is gonna kick us off. Yes, so we're gonna talk about proximity to Blackness for a moment. Um, because one of the things that gets said often is that um, this belief that someone can't be racist because of their partner, friends, family, etc. So I want to first go back to what I just said about the, the roots of all of this, right? That this is embedded in our systems. This is embedded in our practices and policies. So it is never just about interpersonal individual conscious behavior. It is far more complex than that. So that's the first thing. Second thing is Angela Davis talks about this idea, right? In a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We need to be anti-racist. And that's Ibram Kendi's work is really taking that to a whole nother level. I think that proximity to blackness question is, is situated in that non-racist category that isn't really actively interrogating the ways that white supremacy or that whiteness shows up in our families. And so here's an example from social media. Um, you know, a, a black dad um, shared a conversation that he had with his former partner who identified as white about taking their daughter who identifies as in this article as biracial or, or mixed to get her hair braided. And all of the conversations that happen between them that show up as the mom really saying, she's not really black. I don't want her hair to look like that. That's not an attractive hairstyle. All of those anti-black sentiments, right? So this is both her daughter and her former partner. And, and this is the way that she's showing up because she's internalized this about hair that is different than hers, about different hairstyles, et cetera. And so the reason that, that we're sort of calling this out in particular is that that idea that there's an automatic protective covering that you have because of your relationships is actually really damaging and can be harmful. What it is, though, of course, is an opportunity for you to, to think and do better, right? To do it differently. And so I would invite everybody to think about this proximity question in relationship to your own unlearning. So the, the, you know, the degree to which you're learning about the history of race and racism in the United States, the degree to which you're incorporating new paradigms, vocabulary to combat anti-Blackness, and, and the degree to which you're doing your own self-work those things coupled with relationships can actually then be transformative and anti-racist. But, but without the work and the knowledge, the relationships in and of themselves are, are actually, um, in some ways, unfortunately, um, can, can actually be um, amplifying anti-Blackness without or recreating it or, and, and certainly not dismantling it. So in the next example, um, we're going to talk about the fetishization of multiracial people. Um, so fetishizing multiracial uh, children is a form of anti-Blackness in the sense that you may have heard and possibly in your own family experiences, the comments that family members can make about your child, um, particularly their skin color, their hair type, maybe their eye color. Um, and then comparing that to maybe other family members who may have different features, but making it seem that it's negative to have black features, black hair. Um, and when that happens, it connotates this, this message around blackness not being beautiful. And we don't wanna do harm and uh, create ways in which there's a hierarchy of thinking of what is beauty and what is supposed to be, all of it is always connected to whiteness and lightness, um, which is also something to always think about if you're thinking about this on the spectrum, kind of how am I perpetuating this? And unknowingly, we often do this unconsciously, which is also why bias is connected to this conversation too, that we unknowingly say these slight comments that then can actually do more harm than we realize to our children. 
they then start to internalize that racism and then it can create other issues further down the road. Um, some examples that you see in the picture um, around this one woman who was at a recent Black Lives Matter protest that said, um, stop shooting, like I want mixed race kids. Um, that example, Kelly actually had seen online and the, the connotation, the meaning behind that is just really unfortunate that this woman is out there saying that. Um, the other piece to think about is what privileges some of the multiracial community is the fact that we often get comments around being very unique, beautiful, having, you know, these particular features, right? Even comments about, oh, I can't wait to see your mixed baby, or I can't wait to see what they look like. Well, in some regard, if somebody says that to you, you're like, oh, well, you could think that's just something they're trying to be nice and saying, but it also, if you think more critically about it, what are they actually really saying? They're also possibly also connecting that to some feelings around anti-Blackness too. So that's something to also consider. And then thinking about how this conversation continues over like a lifespan. We talked last, uh, last webinar about, you know, developmentally, uh, when you have children that grow into emerging adults and enter into that college phase where I do a lot of my work, um, this still follows to be the same. And there's also been studies that um, have been looked at where multiracial women in particular are at higher percentages to experience sexual assault over other racial categories, which is also something interesting to consider and think about in the topic. Um, yeah, but I think Kelly can say more on that. She knows more about that particular study um, than I do. So yeah, this is all great. I, I was um, just thinking about, and you guys will talk after, I suppose, about how this affects kids and of course what we can do about it, but just thinking about making someone proud, you know, in their own skin in this context of anti-blackness and white supremacy is super tricky, right? Um, I just think about it with our own daughters. We're all kind of different different shades and I'm the lightest and Andrew's the darkest and we're sort of all in between. And um, just I remember doing a lot of the, you know, the black or the berry stuff. And one of my daughters uh, said to me finally like, mom, do you hate your skin? <laughs> and I just sort of had to go like, oh, you know, um, that, that I, you know, I have to think about that and, um, <clears throat> and to reframe it because you really are so aware you know, of what you're, you're countering, that you can kind of lay it on heavy. And that doesn't always work either if your family, you know, because the lighter kid can feel um, like, like not a black enough berry. So anyway, a challenge, I'm feeling, I'm feeling that for sure. Yes, we all are feeling that, I think, as parents. Um, and also, a lot of us who are multiracial as adults are continuing to kind of grapple with these things, um, uh, you know, especially when it comes to kind of exoticizing multiracial people. A lot of us did, growing up, clung to that as a sense of pride. You know, people paid attention to us because we were mixed. Um, so really trying to think differently about um, what that was about and how often who we exoticize is usually mixed with white. Um, that it's not just about being mixed race in general, but it, that white supremacy kind of looms over even how we um, exoticize multiracial people. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk to you a little bit about colorblind um, parenting and socializing with our children. And I, I want to come from a very honest place in saying that um, when, when parents engage, and this is not just parents, but caregivers and helping professionals, when we deploy or use colorblind socialization, we're coming from a loving place, I believe. Um, often uh, parents are, you know, thinking that they're protecting their children. 
um, prolonging their exposure sometimes by minimizing race, um, prolonging their exposure to discrimination or racism, um, or even for um, white children from um, them becoming kind of racist themselves or adopting some of these beliefs and thoughts. Um, when you think about parents, some of us have never experienced discrimination personally. Um, maybe we don't recognize um, how our child's experience is different from our own. Um, so we see that with multiracial families and transracial adopted families um, when parents haven't lived the experience of their children. So it's hard for them to understand it or empathize with it. And um, honestly, some of us have internalized shame um, around our racial group memberships. And, and I think a lot of us are, are you know, only beginning to really love um, and appreciate ourselves and our blackness. Um, so recognizing all of these things to be true. Um, so we're coming from a place of love, um, but then really having to accept, you know, swallow the, the pill that um, colorblindness um, really isn't helping our children when it comes to any of our children. Um, whether they're white, black, mixed, Asian, um, it's not really helping. So here's why. So it minimizes and further separates particularly multiracial black children from their blackness. Um, and we talked last week about the strength that comes with um, having a black identity or having um, an identity with a, a historically oppressed racial group. Um, so when you minimize that or when you say everybody's just human, um, you kind of prevent that child from being able to connect to something that they can feel pride about. Um, so I think that's one way. Um, in the example that I have in this screen, um, I saw this um, on posted on Facebook. So for me, it really shows, um, it really visually represents kind of this um, conflict within this child, um, this young adult, about who she is. So she talks about being raised as human, um, and then she later goes on to quote um, and separate herself from her um, Black cousins and Black family members, and then the Black community. And you see the contradictions in the hairstyle that she's adopted, um, the fact that she sees herself as separate, but also recognizes in how she kind of chooses to express herself that there is a connection. So again, by not talking about these things and talking about race, our children are kind of on their own to have to figure it out. Um, and what we've seen from the research is that they're really ill prepared. So when we use colorblind kind of parenting, they're really ill prepared when they do and they will. Um, come across racism, discrimination, and prejudice. So from our research, you know, um, and this is with emerging adults who, you know, are, you know, young, you know, in their 20s, they're still recalling instances where they've brought up this issue with their parents about race. And their parents either minimized it or dismissed it completely um, or ignored it, you know. So our, even when our children ask and are seeking information, some of us, because of our own uncomfort, because of our own shame, because we want to protect them and spare them from talking about race, are disadvantaged and are left to trying to figure out this stuff about race on their own. So where are they gonna get those messages? If they're not getting them from you, they're getting them from social media, they're getting them from movies, um, and often when you look at kind of representations of race in these uh, sources, they're very much based on these kind of biological existence of race, which we know is not true, but which I think is continuously perpetuated. Um, so again, it's, it's more about us thinking how we can protect our children. Um, yes, I wish this country was not as focused on race as it is. Um, but I also recognize how there's a lot of strength that comes with having pride in being member 
um, particularly of um, the black community, knowing that African Americans have historically built this country. So there's a pride that comes with that, um, but that we have to as parents, caregivers, teachers, educators, helping professionals, really nurture that um, with our children. I wonder about... Um, Can I just interrupt yeah. just one moment? There are a number of people who simply can't read the, um, the quote. So... Oh, uh, sure. Yes. Do you want to go ahead, Kelly? Yes, oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. I apologize for that. I come from a mixed race family. And growing up, the best reminder my dad ever gave me was that there is only one race, the human race. Being mixed... I didn't identify as either black or white, but just as Rachel. I speak out because I have four black nieces and nephews, and I pray they can grow up without the same fears the black community is facing today. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. So I, I was wondering um, about non-black multiracial families and how, um, you know, how anti-blackness shows up there or how, how you think about it and how is it different from how it just shows up generally in, you know, not, you know, in all families, right? Um, because there, especially if you're not white, because there's kind of an, um, very clear messages about sort of trying to assimilate, right? If you can, um, and trying to get, you know, the good stuff, the money, the power, the, uh, the, status, you know, of whiteness. Um, so yeah, I wonder if there's anything particular about multiracial families that are not black. So I can just speak to um, uh, how colorism also influences um, those uh, different groups um, who are not um, mixed with black, but who also have kind of sometimes internalize the idea of the racial hierarchy. So this idea that um, some racial groups are better or worse than others. So things that I've seen in my research has been um, multiracial young adults talking with their parents um, and their parents making comments like, um, yeah, I don't care who you date or who you bring home as long as it's not a black person. Um, so those are some of the things that at least um, we see um, in our research about anti-blackness. So there's almost this removal from, or you just can't do this um, with black people that, that is pretty prevalent. But I imagine Victoria and Marcella see other examples too. Well, let me, um, we have lots of questions coming to the Q&A. Uh, let me ask, I think I have to address it. I'm sorry. So yeah, I'll just ask this one quick question because it's just a sort of a pretty basic question. Can you clarify the difference between quote unquote passing as white and white presenting or are they the same? Not the same. Not the same. Yes, <laughs> I can take that or other folks can take it. I can, um, it's not the same thing. So um, presenting as white is that other people see you as white, but that's not how you identify yourself. Um, so often people see me um, as I've gotten older as looking more white and that I, um, but that's not a way that I identify. Um, passing as white. Um, and, you know, I think Often we think this is happening a lot. We see in the media constant stories retelling of passing, um, but it's when uh, the multiracial person um, claims to be white. Um, yes. Right. And, and, and navigates through the world as a white person. So like Nella Larson or something that was very common in as when my dad came to this country, he lived in black Harlem with his aunt and uncle and, and they couldn't go to white Harlem to see um, because a lot of people from his island were passing. So, um, so that's, it sort of has that connotation, right? Um, as opposed to presenting. So, I mean, that, so it's, I mean, that's a little bit interesting, right? I mean, if we say that identity is certainly subjective to some degree and that people can choose their identities you know, they, there's a connotation in passing, which implies that, right, you're pretending somehow to be something that you're not, which seems at odds with the idea that people should be able to choose 
how, certainly how they identify themselves. Does any, any thoughts on that? I mean, is, is it something we can say today? Do we say that today, that people pass as white or pass as anything else for that matter? People can say anything, right? People can say it, but yeah, do. Yeah. Um, again, it's still just all connected back to where we started in this country. I mean, you think about how passing originated from where this is really connected to, you know, supporting the black um, folks who are enslaved in the South, like having other uh, black folks who were maybe had light skin because of the violence of, if we want to talk like plantation masters and what, you know, they did to, you know, the black women that were on their plantations. Like it again, goes harkens back to the extreme violence that um, our enslaved black communities experienced and their ancestors several generations ago, but still that violence still perpetuates even in today's 2020 society, but we see it in different ways. Um, so yeah, it's, it's so complex. I mean, that's why that it's important to know when we talk about dismantling anti-blackness, we're gonna talk more about the education component and this critical self-reflection that's needed to kind of move us forward. Um, so, we, so we certainly are getting tons of questions and we'll turn to your questions about what people can do as, you know, parents, as uh, teachers, as um, all kinds of folks who are, as grandparents interacting with kids and what they can do, especially if you're, I mean, the teacher question is interesting, right? You've got this big group, you don't know how people self-identify, uh, how their families identify them. What can you do to um, be affirming? you know, to the multi-racial kids among all the other kids. So maybe some strategies um, would be great if, um, maybe we start with, Victoria, should we start with you? So to, yes. Yeah, I mean, to think about the question you just asked about what can, what can teachers do? Well, to, no, to ask just generally, but with teachers in mind as well, um, how to address anti-blackness in your family, in your classroom. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, maybe we can pull up that slide. Yeah, I think I think generally the biggest piece is thinking about this in your own way of self-reflecting. I mean, we talked a little bit about that at the first webinar, that it's important as all of us as individuals, we come to uh, our like life hearing all kinds of messages from our youth all the way up to our adulthood. And there have been so many memories and conversations over that time that you have filtered and taken in maybe unknowingly or knowingly of how you perpetuate um, this anti-blackness piece in your life, whether it's skin color, whether it's connotations of, you know, you don't want to go to that particular community because of X reason, or you think something negative towards a black student. I mean, there are rates of black uh, boys and girls who are uh, given more suspensions and other types of behavioral infractions, even from a young age all the way up to high school, which then maps out to like mass incarceration and all of the other pieces that all connect. But I think what's important, how can you dismantle that? You need to know as an individual, what have, take stock in like what you have learned. Um, what, what is challenging about that? Um, what education do you need? If you don't know the history of the United States, a good book to read is Howard Zinn's People History, People's History of the United States. I mean, that's a, that's a great read that can kind of show you how a lot of these things are all connected to history. But it's a lifelong process. Like, how are you complicit in acknowledging anti-Blackness? Um, is it that in your community, are you living in a homogeneously white space? Are your schools that you're sending your children to predominantly white? Um, or, or we would call like historically white in, in higher education. Um, how can you challenge that by offering different opportunities to engage with uh, different folks in your community uh, and then recognize the impact of internalized racism? So how does that then impact your parenting practices? The importance of therapy is great too. Um, every single one of us needs to do our own self work to be able to know our histories, not only what you can figure out about your own family and ancestry, but 
knowing the histories of the people that you surround yourself with too. So it is, it's a, it's a part of practicing dialogue and asking good questions and not being afraid to kind of dive into understanding new things about your family or the people that surround you. So those are some um, examples around continuing to educate yourself. What do you know? What, you, what do you not know? And then how can you then translate that to your children at, an, at different ages over their, over their lifespan? So critical self-reflection. Other strategies, so, yeah. Did did um, yeah, Marcel or Kelly? Did you want to weigh in on this too? Yeah, um, I was just going to mention, and you see down there a box that says being a counter agent. Um, so often, a lot of the messages that our our children get that we get ourselves um, perpetuate these ideas of white supremacy again, colorism. Um, anti-blackness. So being an active kind of um, parent is to kind of interrupt um, these messages before your children kind of internalize them or take them on. Um, so one way to build counter spaces is to um, build community. Um, and that'll be something Marcella talks about in expanding your networks. Finding spaces where your child is around other both monoracial and multiracial people that represent their various um, racial heritages is very important. Um, I was thinking in the past uh, when my parents found their own group, um, which was for um, multiracial families. And I can honestly say until I became an adult and sought those spaces myself, that that was one of the only times that I ever was around other children that were mixed that looked like me. Um, and we had, you know, it was so um, affirming to kind of be in that space as a young person so much that in my 44 years, it still stands out as something that's really important. Um, so needing to kind of build space for your children, especially for those of us who are living in um, homogeneous environments. What we mean by that is if you're living in settings that are mostly one racial group, or if your network of people is mostly one racial group and your child is mixed with other things, other racial groups, you need to be able to incorporate um, those people in your child's life. Um, so that's why I think it's so um, important to have those counter spaces where people can feel affirmed and talk about their experiences um, around being both multiracial and also a member of these different historical press racial groups. And, and I'll just add a few things to this. I think that one of the things that happens for white parents in multiracial families is that um, things might not always be obvious to you in terms of what is feeling like a microaggression or just a plain old aggression to your child. And so um, one of the examples I just want to share with you very quickly is that my youngest child um, was in preschool and um, there was a princess day and I call this like the princess hair moment um, where she came home and was talking a lot about Rapunzel and a lot about Rapunzel's hair and how most of the other kids in her class who um, all identify as white or had the type of hair texture that could easily look like Rapunzel when they were playing um, were really getting into it and they wanted to do princess hair and Rapunzel every day for that week and it's a it was a child-centered play group. Um, and so this, this play was gen being generated by the kids, but it was obviously not at all neutral or inclusive. And my daughter's hair is like type 3A curl, right? She, she did not, that, that did not reflect her. And, and so it was harmful. And she expressed it in her frustration, but it was my job as the parent then to advocate and to interrupt and to provide alternatives and to have the conversation with the teacher. And I would just say, if that wasn't your experience growing up, that might not be obvious to you. You might think that that is, is a small thing. Um, and I would say that there are many things like that that happen all the time with our children. And I, I would also add that race is hyper visible oftentimes for, for multiracial kids. There, I, I used the example last time about they're, they're constantly looking to organize the world and to figure out where they fit in and, and who's going to match with who in, in families and all of that. And yet it is often not discussed. 
at home, right? So both hyper visible and, 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 you know, top of mind and then not discuss because there isn't a shared vocabulary or there isn't the opportunity to continue to learn and grow and talk about, about race at home specifically. Um, and so I would say that, you know, a couple of things I just want to add, validate your, your children's experiences. If they describe something to you that sounds like a microaggression, you know, validate that. This isn't the time to, to play the sort of perfectly logical explanation role as a parent, right? This is the time to say, can you say more about that? How did that feel? What can we do about that? Would you like me to, to talk to this person? Would you like to talk to this person? What are some strategies that we can do moving forward? And then I would also say um, that having discussions about all kinds of media that you're consuming and children's books is really important because if left to not, you know, not to discuss that that will automatically reinforce this, this standard of beauty around whiteness because that's what the media does, right? It reinforces that. So if you're not actively seeking out representation, children's books alone, just as an example, in 2018, 50% um, of all children's books featured white characters as the main character and 27% featured animals which means 77% of all children's books that came out in 2018 were about white characters or animals, leaving a very small slice that was actually about kids of color. And so it, I would say you might think you're doing a lot at home, but, but it is likely in school and in other places that, that it is the dominant narrative that is being reinforced and that your child isn't likely to see themselves in very much that's happening if you're not actively seeking that out. So the, the final thing that I'll say about this is the extending your networks piece Often this is the conversation that comes up about where to start. If you are not in touch with the, your, your child's family of origin or your partner who identifies as a person of color, how do you find your networks? I would say this is where play dates are really important. This is where play groups are really important, right? If you're not invited to one, start one, right? Start a play group for other kids of color. You know, start um, a, a, a space where your kids can get together and have, have you know, reflection of who they are and their identities or, or find committees or places you can serve and be useful in your unique perspective, right? If you're doing your self work, you're doing your learning and unlearning and you're in your relationships, you actually could be really useful in these conversations. And that might be another place to find extended networks. So those are just three tangible things that I wanted to, to make sure to underline because I think this is a lifelong commitment, as you know, but our, our neutrality in this is, is not an acceptable position. When it comes to our families, there is so much that is being shaped by those intimate relationships. And I just want to underscore that in our families, that is often where our kids are getting hurt the most, right? Because it is other family members, you know, comments about hair or skin or, or who you look like or what percentage of whatever you identify with. And that actually isn't about what's happening out there. That's about what's happening right in our spheres of influence in, in our immediate families. So that's where you need to get bold and you need to feel like it's okay to make decisions about who can and can't have intimate access and relationship to, to your child. And you need to get comfortable with confronting that um, because that actually, the, the research really does show that if you don't do that, right, the harm that gets done, the internalization of, of that kind of racism coming from family members is very hard to, to unpack later. And it creates all kinds of, of fractures um, in, in families and in communities. So I just, to end with that. Yeah, thank yeah, you, Marcella, no, and thank really, you I hear that. all. Absolutely. You know, we have a, a, a whole bunch of questions around a topic uh, that comes up repeatedly. It's a powerful strain in what we hear mm -hmm. from people, which is really this issue of um, how do I uh, find or how do I support my child in having a healthy white identity, mm -hmm. right? And in this, in the case of uh, sort of multiracial uh, children, you know, it becomes, um, you know, there's a, there's often a lot of attention, especially to the, if you have a white parent and a, and a parent who identifies otherwise, right, the question become is often, how do we, you know, support a healthy multiracial identity that accommodates, you know, at the, say the least, the, the, uh, the, the of color part, right, but we have a bunch of questions here, which ask, you know, offer variations on, gosh, how do we get them to embrace? And Marcel, actually, last time you talked about, right, your mixed and black daughters and, and your older daughter in particular, right, and you know, uh, St. Pat, St. Patrick's Day, right? Yeah. And, and how to, you know, have um, you know, her saying to her teacher maybe, no, no, really, I, <laughs> I have an Irish mom. This is my 
it is my dirt, not just because we're all Irish mm -hmm. on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so I just wonder if you have any general wisdom, you know, for both the, we have some white parents who are saying, gosh, how do I remain, how does my identity remain healthy as I try to, you know, help my child forge a healthy identity, multiracial identity, his, her, their own, et cetera. Any wisdom for, for those folks? And I guess, and I'll also add, I mean, it's clearly related, but yeah, how do I have my child, support my child to not in effect reject, right, or prioritize, uh, you know, his, her, black, you know, brown, and the et cetera, identity over the white, which feels like it's also part of who they are. Any wisdom on that? I can answer just, and Please? I know everyone else will chime in on this. I mean, I think that for me, talking about oppression without also talking about liberation is really harmful. So I, I think it's very important that we are using vocabulary in our homes, not just about race and racism, but also about liberation. And what does that look like? Because the oppression dehumanizes all of us. Um, it dehumanizes the people who identify as white, it dehumanizes people who identify as people of color. And so that shared vision around what would liberation look like? You get to be your whole self. You get to show up and talk about all of your identities in an integrated, healthy way. And, and other people receive that, right? So for me, I think it is really important to, to give examples of, of, you know, everything in history from abolitionists to, you know, civil rights activists to how people are forming coalitions now and supporting racial justice movements from, from all different backgrounds. I, I actually think that's really important. There is a ton of imagery about white people. There is not a lot about white anti-racist activism in, in popular culture that is that is able to be translated to children, right? So I think that, that those role models are important, those stories are important. Um, and, and so for me, I think the humanizing and, and the liberation piece becomes critical. Right, so uh, that's great, I'm Marcella, sorry, thank Victoria, you. Tori, you wanted to weigh in on that? I also just think about the questions, right, that, that, were, that were just asked. I mean, you think about what we started with this conversation about white supremacy and whiteness, like the way I understand the concept of why it's being asked around how do I not have my child lose that sense of whiteness, but that's actually kind of the message that we're trying to counter today is that your, your child won't lose that sense of their whiteness. They're, they're growing with your families and it's dominant in US society that whiteness is best and that lightness can give you access to all these privileges. What we're, what we're trying to say is to counter a little bit of that, which is why this conversation is so challenging. It's not that I have a white father. It's not that by me identifying with my Indo-Caribbean heritage, do I negate his existence? I think of it as an and, like Kelly mentioned at the beginning, it's both and. So I identify as Indo-Caribbean, white, Irish, and I don't separate those things out and kind of how I discuss my race. That's a healthy way of discussing that and it doesn't negate my whiteness either. Um, it doesn't say that I'm denying my Mulaney heritage or my, or my white family members, but at the same time, it also embraces my Caribbean family members too. It doesn't distance them nor negate those ancestors and those people who have I've learned from my, my culture, the other pieces to all of it, it brings it all together. So I think it's hard to be able to think about, well, I need my child or I need my, my, my family member to also understand. I think it's about both and. So you have to notice too that as your child grows, they are gonna identify with different things over their lifespan. We talked about fluidity last time about multiracial people. There's gonna be different points in time where your child and your young adult eventually will identify, look, culturally connect to different pieces of your family's like history. They may negate it, they may accept it, but that's part of the mixed experience. So that's just something I wanna stress and I kinda of wanted to name it, but I was like, oh, oh, but I, I just really wanted to say that. I think that's important. And so I think if you're a white parent, don't despair that your child is like negating you in any way. I think it's just a matter of the process and being comfortable to allow them to explore. Absolutely. Um, so we're, we're near the end of our time together, but I was wondering, uh, in terms of empowering, having these conversations, 
you know, at home and creating that environment as we can, when we can, while our kids are little and as they get bigger, they're out of the house more and more. Um, but I'm wondering about that, that teacher piece or that classroom piece and just thinking about how now um, a lot of classes ask people how they identify gender wise on the first days. Um, you know, how would you, I can imagine doing the same, um, you know, in a school, you know, what's your talking about how one identifies themselves and how they, they tend to be identified. Um, or maybe just starting with the how to identify myself. Um, I'm wondering what strategies or what you would say to teachers who want those, you know, we're almost starting school, possibly virtually. Um, what can they do in those first weeks to set the table for multiracial and other kids? Um, I, one thing I will suggest that, and I can send a link, you know, when you send things out after, um, two activities that I use and I teach all the time are the name story and life mapping. And both of them are, the life mapping is longer, but the name story can be done very quickly and gives students a chance to talk about the history, origin, meaning of their names. Their first name, middle name, last name, nicknames, you know, how they got their name, what it means, if there's a cultural connection. Often that sets the table for students to disclose whatever they need or want to disclose about their background on their own terms in a moment when it's very appropriate to be sharing about your name and how you how you want people to call you in a, in a particular space. And so I would say sometimes it needs to be um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is really on the terms of the student themselves, right? I think that the idea, particularly for younger kids to have to go around and, and name categories that they might not yet have figured out is very hard. And so I think that putting it in your own words, giving space for that and role modeling that, you know, my name is Marcella and it means this, and this is why it's important to me is, is a good way to That's it. awesome, I love that. Uh, I just want to mention too, um, in considering kind of that activity, some, some children might not know, particularly children who are um, transracially adopted might not know about that history. So that might also be something that the teacher can encourage kind of conversation um, or have the child kind of invent their own meaning for their name. Um, these are other things that you can do. I think you have to communicate with your teacher. I think you have to advocate for your children, make sure that representation of multiraciality is in the school whether through the curriculum, whether through different books in the library, um, and also make sure that the forms are not being monocentric and restricting how our children are identifying is a good first step. Victoria, any, <clears throat> any thoughts on this question? I mean, I, I would just echo what Kelly just mentioned at the, the last part about the forms. Um, when, you, when you're filling out as a parent your child's race, um, that question comes up, and I even think about this when this happened to me as a young kid. Um, and even still at, in my 30s, I can recall this, where the, in Florida, I don't know whether they still do this or not, but they would literally call your name and then like say your race too to like confirm, like in the roll call, which was so in interesting now that I think about it. And there wasn't at the time an ability for parents to check multiple boxes. So my mother always just said, check other because that was the only option we had. So that would be something that I just always struggled with as a kid, like thinking about what does that mean? How am I other? But that's a whole nother like conversation on, on the multiraciality and like the experiences. But I think it's important to know that if you notice things like that in your school surveys or in your school forms as a parent, like be that person to have a conversation with the principal or whoever is the appropriate person to say like this isn't limiting this doesn't give my ability to check multiple boxes for how my child identifies so those are other ways that you can actually help to change and shift um, what Kelly is mentioning the monocentric functioning of like policy and practice that happens still in education um, so that's just one thing to just kind of keep note of and, and mindful of. I mean, we see it uh, in a lot of other systems too, but if there's an ability to change it and as a parent, you have a lot of power in the school systems in, in, in certain respects, like that's one way you can kind of advocate. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank um, you all. I mean, I, I would also say uh, as for teachers, don't assume, you know, don't assume by looking at someone and maybe teaching kids but yes. um in you know when you read a book uh that we don't know who do you think you know what do you think where do you think this child's from or what race you know we don't necessarily have to know we might 
think we know, but we shouldn't assume. Um, thank you all. Thanks this was everyone. really a wonderful two-parter. If you guys missed the first part, you can find it on our site. You can find it on Facebook. And uh, this will be up on our site as well in the transcript. And these guys put together so many resources for this, uh, in addition to last time for this program. So we'll put those on our website as well. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Take Night. care. Bye-bye.